Just a brief uh, notice. It's a huge joy and a delight to be able to uh, welcome Charlotte Bradley as our guest preacher this morning. We're so pleased that you're here. And this is a really excellent opportunity. And we all look forward to meeting you after Mass over coffee in the courtyard. One minor little problem, we can't quite get to the bottom of where this has occurred, both in your pew sheet and in the Daily Telegraph. <laughs> Father Julian Browning is listed as this morning's preacher. So if you're a Daily Telegraph reader that came to Mass this morning solely with the intention and excitement of hearing Father Julian, I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed, but we have the equally exciting proposition of Charlotte's uh, homily today. So uh, thank you very much for being with us, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say to us. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. May I speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I've been thinking a lot recently about the concept of service in relation to the prison population. As part of my role, I've been working in two different prisons recently, one running a well-being course with inmates in a women's prison in Surrey, and for a separate reason, doing some work with families and visitors coming to see inmates at a men's prison in Hertfordshire. So when I read this morning's gospel and Jesus' well-known saying, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. It was the prison population who came to my mind. Why is it that we talk about people serving their sentence in prison or in the community? It certainly suggests a degree of willingness on the part of the inmate. Well, if it's a sentence that they feel is just or deserved, it makes sense. They are serving society through the loss of their freedom in order to pay the community back for the crime they've committed. Some of you might have watched a really brilliant drama on the BBC a few months ago called Time, which was a very compelling and visceral depiction of life inside a men's prison. It followed the arrival and the subsequent time spent in prison of a character played by Sean Bean, who had been found guilty of causing death by dangerous driving after being well over the limit and hitting and killing a cyclist. He, his character was hugely remorseful, desperate for redemption and for forgiveness from the family and especially from the wife of the man he had killed. And he therefore saw his sentence and the violence that he was subject to inside prison as being entirely just. He welcomed it almost. The writer obviously had a few, I thought, very salient points to make about the purpose of prison, the unsuitability of prison for a lot of people in there, and the possibility or impossibility of redemption following a crime. And I thought the most telling line of commentary on the prison service in this country was that spoken by Sue Johnson, who played his mother, who was aghast at the violence and the bullying he was being subject to, and even more his acceptance of it. You're in here as punishment, not for punishment, she told him. That's what prison should be in a civilized society, not the loss of dignity or safety, but the loss of one's liberty. That is the service a prisoner does. But that kind of service, the loss of liberty and status, which, which is eventually the kind of service offered by Jesus in his cross and passion, is probably not what James and John had in mind when they put their request to Jesus that we heard in today's gospel. It's worth remembering that this passage comes very soon after these two sons of Zebedee had been up the mountain with Peter and Jesus, where they witnessed the transfiguration. They had seen his clothes become dazzling white. They had seen Moses and Elijah appear alongside him. It's what we might call the glamorous side of God's glory. So when they ask to sit at his right and left hand when he comes in glory, perhaps appearing alongside him in that kind of scenario is what they had in mind. It's safe to assume that they don't realize that if they were granted their request, it would not be thrones that they would be sitting on, but instruments of torture and death that they would be nailed to. That Christ would receive a crown of thorns, not of jewels, at this great moment of triumph. And of course, who is it who, in the end, do take these coveted places? 
It's two criminals, two prisoners released from <coughs> prison in order to be nailed to crosses. After the disciples, James and John among them, had fled in fear, it's those who have been serving sentences who serve Christ in the end as his companions to his final crowning in glory. The 17th century Christian writer William Secker once wrote that God has three sorts of servants in the world. Some are slaves and serve him from a principle of fear. Others are hirelings and serve him for the sake of wages. And the last are sons and daughters, I shall add, and serve him under the influence of love. Three kinds of Christian discipleship, slaves, hirelings, sons and daughters. And I think we see examples of all three in the Gospels, and you can see them by the way that Jesus responds to them. Firstly, slaves, those who serve God from fear. We often encounter Jesus in discussion with the Pharisees, who are slaves to the law, serving not through love, but because they are too afraid of the repercussions if they break any of the rules. Secondly, hirelings, those who serve God in order to be paid, not necessarily with cold hard cash, but perhaps paid with status or power. We might put the scribes into this category, who enjoy the public attention and status that comes with their role. And on occasion, the disciples fall into this category, a good example being the request made by James and John, thinking that sitting at Jesus' right and left hand would bring them glory and adoration. And finally, sons and daughters, those who serve God through love. There are plenty of examples of these in the Gospels. The sinful woman who anoints Jesus' feet with her hair, even while Simon the Pharisee sneers and criticizes her. Mary and Martha, who welcome him into their home. Mary sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to him, Martha serving him food and drink. Jesus' mother, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene and the beloved disciple, who stood at the foot of the cross and stayed with Jesus until his dying breath. And again, when the twelve disciples get it right, they serve through love too, leaving their homes and livelihoods to follow Christ. Peter, after initially being horrified at the thought of Jesus washing his feet, wants to share in his servant ministry and asks Jesus to wash not just his feet, but his head and his hands too. So which kind of servant are you? Is your faith and discipleship motivated by fear, by the potential for praise and glory, or by love for Jesus Christ? I suspect that if we're honest, most of us will experience all three at some stage in our Christian journey. So if we're in the first or the second category, how do we move from serving through fear or for payment into serving for love? I was reminded by a brilliant former colleague of mine a while ago of some words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. We were discussing how it is that people come to faith and how we might encourage people who want to have faith but can't seem to get there. My colleague reminded of me of these words of Bonhoeffer who said, don't say, I wish I had the faith to do that. Do it and the faith will come. So we might say to a person who wants to have faith, Start coming and living the life of faith, and the faith will come. Or the person who is inspired by good works they see Christians doing in their community. Start serving your community alongside those of faith, and the faith will come. Or to the person who has faith, but has it through fear or because of the status it might bring. Follow Jesus Christ, and the faith and love for him will come. And I expect all of us can think of examples of people who have been drawn into the community and subsequently the life of faith through acts of service to their community. You can possibly all think of someone who started helping to run the weekday toddler group because a church-going friend roped them into it and then came to the family service and then started coming every week and became a disciple of Christ. Or someone who sees a notice outside a church about a homeless shelter offers to volunteer at it becomes intrigued by the church building and what goes on there on a Sunday, comes along and gradually comes to faith. It's not just that those who have faith are motivated by that faith to do acts of service, though of course that's a good thing, but it can so often work the other way around. I know you're thinking here at All Saints at the moment about ways in which you can engage with and serve your local community. 
And living out your faith through service to the community is a wonderful way to serve the people around you. But it's also a way of drawing those outside into the life of faith. Do it, and the faith, and I might add, the faithful will come. And when we are God's servants, who are sons and daughters, who are serving because we love, that is when we are most aligned with the kind of servanthood that Jesus displays. When we serve because we love, we won't make requests or even harbour desires for glory or for status. In a famous passage from John's Gospel, Jesus says, I do not call you servants any longer. I have called you friends. <coughs> when we serve because we love, we do so because we know that we are not a slave or a hireling, but a friend of Jesus Christ, a beloved son or daughter of God, whose endless love and mercy will overflow from us into the beloved sons and daughters of God, drawing them into that endless mercy and love. Do it, and the faith will come. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Amen.